Hey, Westbrook Online, welcome to our services today. We're so thrilled that you have chosen to join us today in our time of worship and teaching. We're in a series called Managing Meltdowns, where we're studying some Bible character studies of people who in their own right experienced some challenges in their life, but at the same time, they clung to God and they became Hall of Famers. I hope and pray that you'll be blessed by our study today. We wanna make sure that before you leave today, you have opportunity to connect with us. It's so important. If you're a part of our uh, con- online congregation, that you connect with us, let us know that you're watching, let us know how we can serve you, and let us challenge you to be faithful in ministry here at Westbrook. We have lots of opportunities for you to serve, lots of opportunities for you to engage, even if you're part of our online family. One thing that we wanna challenge you to do is to be faithful uh, as a steward to be a part of blessing this ministry with what God has provided for you. We're so grateful for that. And you can go online and find out ways to give. Let me also say before you end this this service today, make sure you find some time to remember what God has done for you uh, through uh, his death, burial, and resurrection in a time of communion. Find a, a piece of bread, find a cup of juice, and make sure that you take a moment to reflect upon what Jesus has done for you. With all of that, we're gonna move into our time of worship, and we're gonna go into our time of teaching today, but we want you to be encouraged in every way to trust God, put your faith and trust in God, connect with us so that we can join in that journey with you and we know that God will be blessed. Let me pray and then we're gonna go into our time of worship. God, thank you for this moment that we have to be together. God, I pray for whoever is watching that you'll bless their lives in immeasurable ways, in ways that they can't even imagine because God, they're putting you first in their life. Thank you for opportunities to study your word, for opportunities to worship you, and opportunities to serve you wherever we are in this incredible world. Thank you, Lord, for this great online family. In your name we pray, amen. Well, God bless you. Enjoy the service today. Good morning, church. Welcome to Westbrook. Would you stand? We're gonna worship the Lord together.
children then you hear your children now you are the same god you are the same god you answered prayers back then and you will answer now you are the same god you are the same about in the scriptures, the God of Jacob, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac. It's the same God that we worship here in this place today. No matter what mountaintop or valley you're in, He will meet you there. So let's continue worshiping Him together. You free the captives and you're freeing hearts right now. You are the same God, you are the same God, you touch the lepers then, I feel your touch right now, you are the same God, you are the same God. In the stressful and overstimulating world that we live in, becoming so overwhelmed by your stress that it significantly affects your behavior and emotional meltdown can happen to all of us. None of us are exempt. And just because you are a Christian doesn't mean you aren't prone to a meltdown as well. Now, an emotional meltdown isn't exactly a medical diagnosis. 
It's used in popular dialogue to, to, to describe when we are overcome emotionally, when we, when we hit a breaking point. For some people, a, a meltdown, it may look like crying uncontrollably. For others, it may look like snapping at others or lashing out angrily. And for others, it may involve panicking or running away from a stressful situation. Therapists would say that an occasional meltdown is completely normal. You may suddenly burst into tears or you may lash out with anger because you feel out of control or overwhelmed with pressures, uh, things in your life that are unpredictable. And that doesn't mean that something is wrong with you. It may, however, be an indication that you are going through a challenging time or and some of your personal and emotional needs are not being met and in our context around here in the life of a church we most certainly would include our spiritual needs well the good news is that you can recover from a meltdown you can also learn to manage the stressors in your life that threaten to push you over the edge so that future meltdowns are less likely And this spring, as a follow-up to the joy of Easter, we thought we'd share some words of encouragement from the Bible when those moments of meltdown come. Now, like I said last week, if you watched Westbrook Online, we're certainly not predicting downer moments, but just since it seems that that, that, that downer moments also, or often I should say, (coughs) follow the highs and the joys of life, we felt it really powerful to arm our congregations with some words of hope from Scripture uh, if and when those times inevitably come. You know, the Bible tells stories and, and gives insights to normal people like you and me whenever we're living life, right? Just like God focuses, you know, important events of his plan on ordinary people, it also offers real world navigations for Joe, normal Joes like us. So, so this is a series that we're in right now, Managing Meltdowns, as we move into spring, is intended to teach us a few things from God's word as it relates to handling some common challenges of anxiety. And, and some of these issues of anxiety are not just bothersome concerns, they can become full-blown meltdowns, can't they? Well, how do we manage those things and keep our Christianity and our, keep our humanity intact, especially, especially when they come on the heels of wonderful times <coughs> and joyful times and the like? Let's look at this. We started last Sunday by talking about a single chapter in the Bible that lists a bunch of people's names. And, and, and these people are in Hebrews chapter 11. If you want to uh, grab your Bibles and follow along with me, Hebrews chapter 11, there are a bunch of people with great stories, but people who are keenly aware of the ups and the downs of, of life, just like you and me. Again, find Hebrews chapter 11 in your Bibles, if you will. A lot of times our Bibles, uh, this passage is called the Hall of fame of faith. And, and as I said, it's filled with names of people from the Bible who learned how to manage their challenges. They learned how to manage their meltdowns as well as their joyful moments. And through it all, they were labeled as hall of famers. They were heroes of the faith. I think this is so cool and so encouraging to know that that, that can be the same thing for us. And, and if you were with us again, if you watched the sermon last week online, we kicked this series off and we talked about this lady who is mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, excuse me, verse 11. Her name was Sarah and her meltdown could be labeled as waiting. <laughs> We talked about that. If you missed that sermon, maybe go back to Westbrook Online or to to, to our YouTube uh, channel and watch the message. And as we preached this message live, nearly everybody in the room admitted that they struggled with waiting. They struggled with patience. They struggled with the frustration that comes with it. We talked about how to handle that, waiting. Today, another issue that can cause meltdowns in our life is chaos, if you're watching this sermon right now, can you kind of relate to that? Is there some things in your life that are a bit chaotic that sometimes cause you to lose it? Chaos caused by challenges that you're going through or maybe your family or the pace of your life or the temptations that beset you. 
a lot of people could really speak into this. Well, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 22, mentions this Old Testament guy named Joseph. You might be familiar with this story. He was a Hall of Famer, and, and for sure, while the end of his life, the end of his story, turned out pretty okay, there were certainly issues and areas of chaos that he had to deal with throughout the course of his life. And when you read his story, I'm pretty certain that you can agree with me that there was some, probably some meltdowns that occurred in the midst of all that. Here's the Cliff Notes version of his story, but flip over to, to Genesis chapter 37, if you don't mind. Flip over to Genesis 37. Here's, here's the Cliff Notes, right? Joseph, the son of Jacob and Rachel, by the way, Sarah from last weekend was his great-grandmother. Joseph emerges as a central figure in the Old Testament narrative, renowned for his remarkable journey from betrayal to blessing. From betrayal to blessing, his story unfolds in the book of Genesis where he endures betrayal by his brothers, he endures slavery in Egypt, an unjust imprisonment, that'll cause some chaos in your life. However, through God's providence and Joseph's unwavering faith, read his story, he rises from prominence to second in command to Pharaoh overseeing the nation's affairs during the time of a famine, probably chaos-inducing as well. Through it all, through it all, Joseph's story teaches us some valuable lessons about forgiveness or resilience, a trusting in God's sovereignty. Despite facing adversity and injustice, Joseph remains steadfast in his faith, and he maintains integrity in all circumstances. And his ability to forgive his brothers and reconcile with them demonstrates the life-altering and a, a power of forgiveness and the importance of reconciliation in relationships. Moreover, Joseph's unwavering trust in God's plan, even in the darkest moments of his life, serve as a powerful reminder that God works in all things uh, for, together for good for those who love him and for those who are called according to his purpose. Bottom line, get this down, friends. The bottom line, Joseph's life serves as an inspiring example of faithfulness and resilience and the redemptive power of God's grace in the face of adversity. Furthermore, Joseph teaches us that we can go from chaos to calm, from chaos to calm when we put our full trust in God. Now, Unfortunately, time doesn't allow us to look at every uh, ac aspect into every part of Joseph's story. It, it, it doesn't allow us to read the complete narrative, Genesis chapter 37 through chapter 15. You ought to write that down, Genesis 37 through 15, and you ought to read it this week. It's a pretty fascinating story. But what I want to do today is just take a look at, at, at one of the meltdown and producing parts of, 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 of the chaos of Joseph's life before I then leave you with some words of application and some words of challenge for you to take home. Here's what we're going to look at today in this message. How do we manage the meltdown of chaos? How do we go from chaos to calm? How do we do that? Well, let's start with the chaos of adversity. And again, uh, some of you maybe are prone to this meltdown. Your components of your life are just chaotic all the time. And you find yourself melting down. How do you deal with that? Well, let's look at the chaos of adversity. Really fast, turn to the first passage today, Genesis chapter 37, verses 12 through 36. It's a rather long passage, but stick with me here. Let's read it together, and then I want to put some thoughts out there. Joseph had just received his technicolor dream coat. You might remember the, the coat of many colors from his dad. He, he, he had told his folks and his brothers about his dream. They thought he was a putz and couldn't hardly stand him. Let's pick the story up in verse 12. We're going to read through verse 36 to the end of the chapter. Hang on with me here as we do this. Follow along in your Bibles, if you will. Now, his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem, and Israel had said to Joseph, Israel was the dad, as you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I'm going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. 
So he said to him, go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring word back to me. And then he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. (coughs) When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, what are you looking for? And he replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? They have moved, from, moved on from here, the man answered, and I heard, him say, heard them say, let's go to Dothan. And so Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan, but he's, they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Adversity. Here comes the dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him, and then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern here in the desert, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. And so when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the richly ornamented, ornamented robe he was wearing. Remember the, the technicolor dream coat. And, 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 and they took him and they threw him into the cistern. And now the cistern was empty. There was no water in it. <clears throat> and as they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices of balm and, uh, uh, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. And Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood, and his brothers agreed. So, verse 28, when the Midianite merchants came by, the brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took him to Egypt. And when Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, the boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? And they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornamented robe back to their father and said, we found this. Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. And he recognized it and said, it is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. All this kind of dysfunction. Do you see that here, right? All this has been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, in mourning will I go down to the grave to my son. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials and captain of the guard. Well, I want you to see this chaos of adversity probably would create some meltdowns, huh? Well, we look at these verses and we can note several adversities here or, or problems that Joseph had to, to deal with. Now, now, keep in mind that Joseph is but 17 years old when all of these things begin to happen to him. He didn't have years of experience under his belt to help him deal with really anything, difficult situations, yet here's what I want you to see. He was able to turn his life from chaos to calm because he hung in there. Let me show you this. The first adversity that Joseph faced was a difficult family situation. Think about that. You see it there, right? To put it bluntly, it was kind of multi-tiered. First of all, Joseph's father, Jacob, evidently as we read that, kind of seems like a lousy father. The family was plagued with immorality and with hatred and violence and jealousy and distrust and deception. And Jacob not only allowed this to continue evidently in his family, but in some cases he was guilty of it himself. Well, in today's text that we just read, we we once again see Jacob's poor uh, parental skills. Because of his lack of involvement in the family's life, he he placed Joseph in a very difficult situation. Jacob's sons had had left no doubt in anyone's mind that they hated their brother viciously. And they were capable of murder. That was the first thing that they said when they saw him coming. Jacob must have been aware. The dad must have been aware uh, of the hatred that existed between Joseph and his brothers. Yet what does he do? He goes ahead and sends him to them anyway. Well, I think that we can apply this a little bit to our own times that we see because often as you look around, we see many, how, how blind many parents are when it comes to what's going on in their own family. 
We often send our own children into dangerous situations without preparing them to face adversity. Listen, friends, don't do that. Don't send your kids into dangerous situations without preparing them uh, through life first. Joseph ended up in this adverse situation, you see, because it, uh, it's just apparent that he didn't have a father who cared enough to see the own hatred in his family, a father who didn't see what was going on in his own family, a father who didn't prepare his own son to face adversity. So that's, that's the first part of chaos is this, this, this difficult family situation. But there's another one, though. Second adversity that we can see from, from this passage that Joseph had to deal with, and that was rejection. Rejection. How else do you say it? it, it, it it's quite clear that, that Joseph's brothers flat out reject him. When they first saw him coming, they, they, they instantly plotted to, to kill him. This is how deep their jealousy ran. They despised him so much that as soon as the opportunity afforded itself, they plotted, they planned <clears throat> on how to get rid of their brother. Now, now, we see that one of the brothers, Reuben, had some compassion, talks them into sparing his brother's life. So instead of s- uh, selling you know, and just killing him, they sell him into slavery to some Midianites who in turn sell him to Joseph, Joseph to this Egyptian named Potiphar. I, I, as you're listening, I, I, I don't know. I'm certain that the that, that people who are listening to this probably know what it's like to feel rejected, be it from your parents, your, your siblings, your friends, whomever. I, I, I know that many times I have felt rejected, and I know that Pastor Caleb a few months ago talked about being the fact that he was always picked last on sports teams. I, I can't always relate to that, but, but there were times when I felt rejected, Rejection is, a, is an adverse adversary that, that we all face, right? And for most of us, it's, a, it's an adversity that we'll probably face again. Yet Joseph, here's what I want you to see. He turned chaos into calm. He was faithful even in his rejection. He seemed to manage. So must we be faithful to God when we feel rejection? There's a third thing, though. Family, dysfunctional family life, rejection. The third adversity that Joseph faced was, was desertion. His brothers threw him into a cistern well, right, and, and, and would have deserted him, left him there in the desert, had they not come up with this great idea of selling him as a slave. Now, a dry cistern well is not the most pleasant place to be thrown into. It would have been bug-infested and, and dirty, and there would have been no way out unless somebody helped you out, right? What's even more worse, what's even worse than that, uh, right after they threw him in, do you see what they did? Right after they threw him in, get rid of their brother, what do they do? They sat down to eat. (laughs) How callous do you have to be that you do that to your own brother and then you sit down for a meal as if nothing happened? (sighs) They finally deserted their brother by selling him into slavery. Now, slavery was certainly not a pleasant existence, you can imagine, right? You become nothing more than just an animal. Can Can you just imagine how deserted he must have felt as they took him away, knowing that he would most likely never see his father or his brothers again, not knowing where he was going, not knowing what would become of him? Well, again, some of you have felt that. Some of you, you, you've dealt with this. Maybe a parent or a spouse or some family member. Sometimes we're deserted by those who call themselves our friends. But again, again, we see in Joseph turning chaos to calm. How? He, he, we must remain faithful to God like Joseph did, not blaming God, but praising him. No matter what the adversity is, physical or emotional, ensure that your faith in God remains unshaken. And we'll talk about the do's and the don'ts of how to do that in a moment, but adversity can cause chaos, and chaos can cause meltdowns. Let me give you one more, though, real fast. Joseph's colorful story, not just his coat, but his, his story was quite colorful, also includes temptation. Temptation, that, that, that can bring the chaos of adversity, which can lead to meltdown. That's the fourth thing, temptation. Anybody can relate to that. Maybe as you listen to this, you can relate to this. We'll flip over to chapter 39. Now, when we left Joseph just a couple of moments ago, he had been sold into slavery by his brothers to a band of Ishmaelites, on traders on their way to Egypt. Now, in chapter 39, we see a little bit more. In Egypt, we learn that he is sold to this, uh, as a slave to this man by the name of Potiphar. And while Joseph's adversities no doubt continued, as you read 
this story, things begin to make a change for him. They, they begin to make a turn for the better. Life sort of turned from the pit to the palace, but chaos still bugged him. Verse 39, now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, this is chapter 39, the captain of the guard bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. And the Lord was with Joseph, underline that, and he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. And when his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. And from time to time, he, or from the time he put him in charge of his household and, and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. And so he left in Joseph's care everything he had. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything <coughs> except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well built and handsome and after a while his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he has, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater than in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. Now, I could go on and read the rest of the story. I certainly want you to do that. What you will see, though, as you read it is, this is more than just a story of sexual intrigue. It's the story of the clash of two cultures, two standards of living here. And, and, and it brought chaos and adversity, right? Joseph represents those who belong to God, those whose life uh, uh, are a reflection of his revealed truth. Potiphar's wife <clears throat> on the other hand, represents those who see no higher authority than themselves, who only live for the gratification of their own desires. And when we view this story from that perspective, we see that it's more than just this ancient, interesting drama, right? We see it as a drama that is still acted out each day today. And as the people of God, listen, we are still called to live out the revealed truth of God's word, but we find ourselves living in a culture that is not only hostile to the things of God, but is also intent on seducing the children of God to live on their level. And the result, what can it become? It can become adversity. It can become chaos. Oh man, how I wish I had... Another 30 minutes to talk about this deal, right? Temptation affects us all. It often comes when you least expect it. That's what happened to poor Joseph here, right? Joseph was on, on top of the world. All his hard work was, was paying off, and it was now that he had a, a responsible position when this temptation came. Be, be, beware of temptation, friends. Beware of temptation when you've experienced a victory or when you think you've arrived Makes me think of King David. The temptation came to him when he was in his 50s. He had unified his kingdom. He had expanded his borders. He had brought peace to the region. It was then that he was tempted and he fell. And the Hebrew here has a wonderful way of telling what Potiphar's wife did. It literally says that she lifted up her eyes at Joseph. The Living Bible translation says she made eyes at him. You get the point? But if he had not picked up on what Mrs. Potiphar wanted, she made it crystal clear with her words when she said, come to bed with me. Sometimes temptation comes when you don't expect it. But then remember this, temptation always tries to make sin look acceptable. But get this down, God honors those who dare to say no. Listen, Read all of Joseph's story. He literally went from the pit to the palace. And while he had some adversity to face, some challenges to overcome, some temptations to deny, the end of his life was calm because God's grace and his commitment 
to honor him. Well, I'm kind of coming down to the end. I need to wrap this up. So so, so grab a piece of paper, if you will, out there. I want you to get a few words of application down. Here's some lessons that that Joseph learned, some lessons that I think we could also learn from this passage as well. If you're in this chaotic moment and you're looking for some calm, maybe here's some words that can encourage you. First of all, get this down. Prosperity is temporary. It's amazing how quickly your life can change, right? All can be going so well, and then all of a sudden the bottom can fall out of your world, or you can go, or, or all can be going terribly, then in a short time things can be going great. Joseph went from being the favorite son to a slave in a foreign land in about three days. What a change for him. If life is going smoothly for you now, friends, praise God, be thankful, and if you are struggling, don't despair but remain faithful because God can and God does change things. Here's the second thing. Prosperity is temporary. Adversity is inevitable. Problems and adversity are are, are to be expected. They are a part of life, right? We, listen, we are called to suffer for Christ. The Bible tells us that just as we share in eternal life with Christ, we also need to be prepared to share in his suffering. So be prepared, Be prepared for adversity. Know that it will come into your life at some point. Prepare yourself for remaining true to God, building faith in him when things are going well. That way, when adversity does come, the anchor of faith will be firmly planted and we can remain faithful and true to him when those times come. Adversity is inevitable. Here's the third thing. Effort is essential. Joseph was faithful under adversity, but it took effort. He put forth an effort to remain moral, to remain righteous, to remain faithful to God through it all. Unfortunately, though, some people buckle under adversity. They become bitter with God because they put, no, put forth no effort, uh, expecting God just to take it all away some, some turn to alcohol, some turn to drugs, other, other immoral behavior to try to escape adversity. Listen, we need to realize that facing adversity is hard work. Sometimes we have to push ourselves to, to, to keep coming to church, to read our Bibles, to pray to God, to, to praise Him. Sometimes, sometimes we may not feel like it, but we must put forth an effort to be Faithful. Prosperity is temporary. Adversity is inevitable. Effort is essential. Here's the last one. Write this down. And God is faithful. Life may seem unfair at first, right? At times. Sometimes we think we're getting the short end of the stick. Sometimes we wonder if God is paying attention to us. You know, I've been praying with some folks around here. Family members are racked with cancer. Emotionally insta- emotional instability is wrecking homes. Heartache over out-of-control things prevail. Sometimes it's like insult to injury, and it makes you ask, why? But listen, through all of this, we must learn and believe that God promises us all He promises us all that things will work for the good of those who love him. We need to realize that God sees the whole picture, but we see just a small part. Isaiah 43, verse 2 tells us this. Write down that verse, Isaiah 43, verse 2. It says, when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Friends, listen. Realize that God is faithful through all things. God is faithful through all things. And in his power, he can bring calm to the chaos of our lives. Robert Hamilton, a poem, poet, wrote these words. He said, I walked a mile with pleasure, and she chattered all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow, and ne'er a word said she, but oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. There is no victory without a battle, no crown without a cross, no resurrection without a death, no rainbow without a storm. No sunrise without night, no solution 
without a problem. Folks, listen, throughout all your adversity, whether it be at home, at work, at school, or even the golf course, or whatever you're doing, we must remain faithful to God because He is forever faithful to us. He understands our adversity, and He can give us victory. He can give us calm when we remain faithful to Him. Then I will bless you If you hurt me I will forgive If you hate me Then I will love you I choose the Jesus way If you're helpless I will defend you If you're burdened I'll share the way If you're hopeless Then let me show you There's hope in the Jesus way I'll follow Jesus I'll follow Jesus he wore my sin, I'll gladly wear His name. He is the treasure, He is the answer. Oh, I choose the Jesus way. If you strike me, I will. you chain me, I'll sing His praise. And if you kill me, 